let's turn to our text for today. I'll turn to Acts 42 to 47 with me. Acts 42, uh, Acts 2, 42 to 47. Sorry, I'm getting acclimated to using this. There we go. Um, Acts 2, 42 to 47. And just silently read along with me. It says this. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. May the Lord bless the reading of this word. Now, I have a tendency to start off with quotes, and I don't think I'm going to break that tendency today. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor and great theologian, he said this when speaking of the purpose of the church. He said, the church is the church only when it exists for others, not dominating, but helping and serving. It must tell men of every calling what it means to live for Christ, to exist for others. You see, the question of what a church community should prioritize and how it should be is an important one to answer as we continue to live life together as a Christian community. Some churches in our city, you would have noticed, they focus on social justice and advocate political and ideological agendas. Some churches, they fixate on being cool and relevant to attract huge crowds, especially of young people. Some emphasize entertainment, theatrics, to attract those who are disinterested in church to come so that they may be amused. You see, the question of what church communities should focus on is a crucial question we must answer, especially in light of the now many differing opinions of what a church should do. In answering this question though, Christians are called to look in scripture to see how God intended the church to be. We must look at the book in order to determine what practices God, God has deemed essential for his people and what attitudes he calls us to have within our communities. In our study today, when we look at Acts 2, 42 to 47, what we're going to be doing is we will look at the early church's example to understand what practice they prioritize and what attitudes they had. And in doing this and studying this text, we will seek to understand clearly what a local church should be like. We will look at the example then of the church in Acts to answer these two main questions. The first, what are the essential commitments of a church community? And the second, what are the essential attitudes those in the church must have? But now, in, as, as it has grown to be our habit, before looking at a text, we look at the context. And actually, the context of this passage is rather helpful for us to look at. When we look at the passage that comes before this in Acts 2, verses 1 to 13, we find... In, in this section, that the followers of Jesus here are filled and empowered by the promised Holy Spirit. We find that the Holy Spirit it came to the followers visibly but also audibly as a mighty rushing wind came into the room they were in, but also there was tongues of fire that appeared on each of them. You see, then the followers, after being filled with the Spirit, began to speak in tongues 
so that all that were around them, even from different nations, understood what it was being said in their own language. And the people in hearing them, speaking in their own language, in these tongues, were confused. And they didn't know what was happening. It was quite strange. They didn't see it every day. And some skeptics went to mock them and say, look at them, they're drunk. But then Peter went to them, and he preached the sermon at Pentecost to all the passerby. Not simply to explain the phenomena that they are witnessing, which is right here, right what is happening is these people are not drunk, it's quite early for that. No, they are being filled with this Holy Spirit, and in your midst now, the prophecy of Joel is being accomplished, it's being fulfilled. And then he explained what was happening, the strange phenomena. But also he moved on to present who Jesus is. And he presented that Jesus is the Messiah, Israel's Messiah, and the Davidic King that they've been waiting for. He preached that Jesus came to fulfill God's plan, was crucified, rose from the grave, ascended, and now sits at the right hand of God. And in hearing the good news of Jesus, the people then were cut to the heart. And this phrase here, cut to the heart, it means they were convicted. They followed then Peter's instruction. They heard the gospel. They heard who Jesus is. They know that it was, a part, it was their fault that he was crucified. And many in the crowd who are now hearing the gospel may have been the, those who yelled, crucify him, crucify him. And then they asked, well, how may we too be saved? What shall we do? And Peter instructed them, repent from your sins. Turn and place your faith in Christ alone with the promise that in doing so, their sins would be forgiven. But also that in doing so, the Holy Spirit would fill them and change them and transform them. So this is the context, right? And our passage now that we're going through today, it lays out what comes after this miraculous thing of miracles being performed, but also hearts being changed. And it follows on how the Christian communities, after coming to know Jesus genuinely and now being filled by the Spirit, now are. You see, the early church it exemplifies for us a pattern of commitments and attitudes that all who belong to Christ and are filled by the Spirit are called to have and imitate. The community in Acts, it shows us what actions and attitudes are essential for all church communities, for all who are a part of a church community. And in doing this and in starting this, turn first to verse 42 to 43 with me. And here we will see what the essential commitments of the church community are. Verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. See, verse 42, it begins by stating that the church community was devoted to two main things here. The first is the apostles' teaching, and the second here is fellowship. The word devotion that is here refers to being faithful and consistently being committed to something. At the beginning of verse 42, it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles considered that one of their primary responsibilities was to teach God's word authoritatively. The believers then, in response, considered that one of their primary responsibilities was consistently listening and practicing what they were taught. You see, from the church's early days, the teaching and preaching of God's Word were of the utmost importance. For Jesus had commanded His followers before His ascension, as He gave the Great Commission to teach them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And in response of knowing the Great Commission and their Lord's command, the church then prioritized 
teaching God's word to both saved and unsaved. Well, now then, the question that follows and might be popping up in your mind is why is teaching and learning from God's word so significant in the life of the church? And in answering this, we find that Jesus presents in John 17, 17, that God's people are sanctified or made holy by his word. Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 2, explains that God's word taught and learned is necessary to grow and mature God's people. Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 presents that God's word is needed to equip Christians to live for Jesus faithfully. And in the Old Testament, in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, it presents that our purpose in life is to be in awe and reverence of God, but also to obey His commands as presented in His Word. And additionally, Paul in Romans 10, 17, he presents that faith comes from hearing the Gospel of Christ from His Word. So then, the point is, whether it was coming to a saving faith in Jesus, growing to be conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus, or being equipped to live for Jesus, God's Word play a crucial role. So then God's word must be taught so that the lost might be saved by Christ, that's true, but also so that the saved might mature and so that the mature may be prepared and equipped to live for Him. You see, the church must teach and hear God's word if we want there to be progress and growth in this church. This is why pastors are commanded in 2 Timothy 4 to preach the word in and out of season, whether they want to hear it or not, to all who would listen, to all that are present, you preach the word to them is our primary commitment. And this is why members are urged to come to church and to read their Bibles regularly, not simply because they are told to and they've been grown accustomed to doing it. No, but there is an understanding that the people of God will not grow unless they hear God's voice. There is an understanding then that the love for Christ that people have will only grow if His greatness, His splendor are revealed to them from His Word. Teachers then must commit themselves to making sure that God's voice is heard by their people for progress and growth in a church community, for progress to be made then in our church, church members in response must commit to consistently and faithfully hearing and applying God's word in their lives. Week after week after week. An application then, are we committed to the same thing as the early church was? Do we devote ourselves to hearing and learning from God's Word? Do we take the time to carefully listen and learn from God's Word when it is taught to us? Or are we quick to shut off our brains and stare at our phones whenever God's Word is presented to us? Do we make use of the time when God's Word is being taught to us? Or do we constantly get in the habit of forsaking the gatherings where God's Word can be heard because we much rather spend our time doing something else? The reality is that people often care, especially now in North America, they care very little about the Sunday sermon. They care very little about the weekly Bible study. And oftentimes you find they care very little about even reading their Bible on their own. But for us here, who desire to grow in Christ, and who constantly long that our church would be a growing church, we cannot ever neglect the time spent in God's Word. Unless our church then is filled with individuals who long to hear, learn, and apply God's word 
the reality is we will not grow unless our church continues to devote itself to the regular intake and application of God's word. Our love for Christ will remain small. Our love for another will grow stale. And our church then will begin to die. If we care about our church growing and continuing as we have, each of us who are part of it must continually be devoted like the early Christians were to hearing from their God. A church that cares little about God's word then, it will not grow. Church members who care little about learning and applying God's word will remain spiritual infants. A church filled with apathetic, immature followers of Christ, they will be incapable of fulfilling the purpose of glorifying Christ through their community. If you care about this church's progress, your personal reception to God's word is of the utmost importance. But you see here, along with teaching, the early church was also committed to fellowshipping with each other. First of all, in verse 42, the second half, we, it's helpful for us if we define what this word fellowship means. And now we know for some, fellowshipping is nothing more than socialization. But fellowship means much more than simply just socializing. The word fellowship, it refers to people's personal, familial unity with each other. Fellowship refers to a partnership based on a common belief, purpose, and goal that we have through Christ. To fellowship is to be united because we have a relationship with Jesus in common. To fellowship is to be committed to one another and to serve one another in love, kindness, and compassion because Jesus has joined us together for this purpose. Fellowship is distinguished then from a typical practice of socializing by a common love for Jesus and desire to live for Him that the people have. It is not simply hanging out for the sake of hanging out. It is coming together because we love Jesus. It is a coming together because we desire to know Him more. It is a coming together because we desire to serve Him. And, a long, and, a, and it's a coming together because we long to help each other along the way. So then the early church, they committed themselves to partnering and meeting for this common purpose and goal. But know here that there is two fellowship activities that it highlights, that it emphasizes that the early church took part in. And the first here refers to them devoting themselves to the breaking of bread, to the breaking of bread. Now, some commentators would argue that this phrase, the breaking of bread, is a reference to the Lord's Supper, which is done so that, again, we mentioned that in Sunday school, but so that believers would be constantly reminded that Jesus died for the forgiveness of their sins. But you see here, this mention of the breaking of bread, though we should observe the Lord's Supper, here, this, this mention isn't referring to the, the communion particularly, but rather it's more of a reference to simply eating together and sharing meals. See, the significance of this activity is that sharing meals is oftentimes when individuals can talk, discuss, and learn from and about each other. The fellowship meal then it functions similarly to other meals that we have today. It is a time when we can eat, have conversations, bond, and help promote the idea to each other that we are a family. The second fellowship activity they took part in was prayer. The community which shared a common faith in Christ and had this purpose for living for Christ, they regularly prayed together. 
And throughout Acts, we find that Jesus' disciples often pray for wisdom, for strength, for ability as they face big decisions, small decisions, and also troubling times. And the reality is this, that a church that seeks to do God's will must continually seek God's direction and depend on His help. So then the church prayed because it understood it could not advance God's purpose based on their own wisdom, based on their own strength, based on their own ideas and their own cleverness and their own tactics. No, they understood that in all their decisions and efforts, they are and they were and they will always continue to be completely reliant on God to provide for them. The church prays them, I remind you, to remind ourselves that in all that we do, personally in our life, but especially as a church, we seek to do God's will in all our efforts. And it stopped this church from thinking they could achieve anything apart from God. And it reminded them that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it, they remain. An application then, do we commit ourselves to fellowshipping with one another? Do we prioritize regularly being present and involved in our community? Or do we plan a quick escape so that we could avoid speaking to anybody? You see, the church is a place where Christians are called to come together for the joint mission of knowing, of growing, and displaying Jesus to the world. And in this effort that we've been given, this purpose, this task that we've been charged with, we need the help of each other. Christians then must regularly spend time getting, getting to know each other, talking with each other, and praying for each other. If we ever seek to partner and help each other achieve this common goal, to be united for the gospel, we must establish deep affections and relationships with one another to do the task. And the more time we spend speaking, in knowing, and encouraging, the more time we will begin to love, to care, and be willing to work alongside each other. So then, fellowship meals we share, the times of prayer that we have, these are not trivial things. These are not things we do as a church for the sake of filling out the weekly schedule. No. All these fellowship activities are done for increasing our bonds of friendship so we can better serve and care for each other. But we do these things also because we know that the more we know and love each other, the more we will be able to learn, love and serve alongside each other, which is what God has called us to do as a church community. The more we love and care for each other, the more unity we will experience in our community. And the more united we are, the more significant the witness of our church will have to the world outside. And we show the world outside of how greater God is because He changed us to be people who are once sinful, but to people who are a new creation. So then, my friends, do not neglect to meet together as some have made a habit. That's what Hebrews 12 refers to, or Hebrews 6, I believe. But commit yourselves to knowing and loving each other for the sake of our joy, our witness, and in preparation of Christ's coming. Our church, much like the early church, it must be one where its members are committed to each other. And in fellowshipping with one another, we display this unity and this commitment. So then to answer the initial questions that I brought up earlier, the first one, what are the essential commitments of a church community? The answer that we found so far in our text is one, a commitment to God's word, 
made by the members of the church body, and secondly, a commitment to fellowshipping with each other, which involves spending time and effort and praying alongside one another. But notice, alongside the essential commitments found in the early church, in verse 40, I should say 44, but 44 to 46, it presents here the essential attitudes that the church had. Verse 44 to 46, please read alongside me silently. It says, And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. See, notice here the first set of attitudes that the church was said to have was unity and generosity. The phrase, all who believed were together, it does not refer to them simply gathering together. Instead, this phrase is a reference to the togetherness, the oneness, and the unity they had with one another. They were of one mind, meaning they shared one mutual goal and purpose, and they worked in harmony alongside each other in an effort to further this purpose. Their sense of unity and togetherness then was also demonstrated and further demonstrated by their generosity. When it says they had all things in common, it refers to their commitment to sharing what they had for the good of other Christians. Rather than selfishly hoarding for themselves, they determined that what they had was theirs to share with their co-workers in the gospel. This is furthered by verse 45, which presents that the many who had much sold and distributed some of what they had to meet the needs of those who had little. We find then that the solidarity they shared in Christ resulted in an attitude of generosity towards each other. The early church hearing then, they, they would have probably heard of Jesus' generosity towards them, and they would be compelled to be generous to one another as a response. They would have heard and would have learned from the apostles something similar to what Paul wrote in Philippians 1, or Philippians 2, 3 to 8, where Jesus, in humility and selflessness, he humbled himself, took the form of a servant, and willingly, selflessly, died for them. They would have heard of Jesus' example of selfless and humble servanthood as He washed His disciples' feet. They would have been taught Jesus' command that they are called to love their neighbors as themselves. And the many commands they would have heard of when Jesus called His people to take care of the poor and the needy and the warning to not store treasures on earth. You see, we find that the early church followed Jesus' example of generosity, of selflessness, and the many commands to share what they had. He became generous out of a gratitude to Jesus for, he, for what He had sacrificially done by humbling Himself, becoming like them and dying in their place. Out of a desire then to be obedient to what Jesus has commanded, they shared what they had and took care of the needs of others they considered a part of God's family. However, notice here that this act of selling and being generous was not something they did reluctantly or unwillingly. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Paul later, he emphasizes that those who get, those who share, should not do so reluctantly or under compulsion, but cheerfully. The believers then, they did not share resentfully, but instead, willfully and joyfully, they parted with some of what they had. They shared some of what they had and were generous, ultimately, because they had come to love and care deeply for each other. Remember last month we looked at 
1 John 3 in great detail, and we spent a lot of time emphasizing what it says in the text there, which is genuine love is exemplified in sacrifice for others. And just to refresh, this is what 1 John 3, 16 to 17 says. It says, by this we know love. Jesus laid his life down for us. And in response, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So then in scripture, in 1 John, but also elsewhere, it exemplifies that love is exemplified by sacrificing what we can, what we have, and what we have been entrusted by God for God and His people. To love genuinely means to be willing to sacrifice as Jesus had for the good of others. Here, sharing that is not obligated um, simply because they, they, they ought to. That's not the attitude that God wants us to have, to do these things begrudgingly. But it's, it's advocated here and we're called to do it because sharing, as we understand, and we tell our kids that sharing is caring and caring for the needs of others is a primary way we show we have come to experience God's love. So that an attitude of generosity, this is an attitude the early church had possessed and one we in our church are called to possess too. In application then, do we love each other? Do you care for one another? Do we feel a sense of responsibility for each other because we are united to one another in Christ? In Christ, my friends, we are now made into a family. We are then called to love and care for one another as a family does. We are not to be like the world who cares very little about each other. We are not to become apathetic or cold-hearted towards each other's needs and difficulties. We see the world in seeing others struggle. We find the response is often cold and uninterested. When people see other needs in the world, they respond often by saying, well, tough luck. That's not my problem. Or maybe they respond and say, that's not my business, I don't care. However, the reality for Christians is that each other's lives and struggles, if we truly do see ourselves in each other as a family, each other's lives and struggles are our business. We are set apart from the world, I remind you, and changed by Jesus to be a people who love and deeply care. We understand that Jesus did not treat us dismissively, but cared for our need for a Savior and sacrificially gave His life because He cared for us. He loved us deeply and sacrificially. He made our problem His business. So then in response, we are likewise called to care. We are called to sacrificially love one another with time, with our time, with our effort and our resources. We are called to give what He has entrusted to steward for the sake of each other. You see, a community that has come to genuinely to understand the great generosity of God as He gave His Son for us becomes generous in response. A community that experiences Christ's loving care responds by lovingly caring for each other. And you see, this is why our church's model, and I bring this up often, is a church that cares and shares God's Word. Now, we choose this model, and they did in the past, because we know that at the heart of the Christian movement, from the very beginning, there has always been an attitude of generosity rooted in a desire to lovingly care for each other. Caring then for each other's needs is how we show we have been united to Christ and each other. Apathy, indifference towards one another, reveals we do not fully understand what God has done for us. A people who have been loved by God and transformed by Him 
exemplified by their generosity. The attitude that belonged to the early church that we too, we must seek to embody. Now, the next attitude, turn to verse 46, and again, the next attitude that the church presented was that of joy. And every day, well, every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Here, the author Luke, he presents that the early church regularly met in temple and houses with each other. And this meeting together every day would have not been the entire church meeting every day. But rather, this refers to individuals who are a part of the larger community. They were consistently meeting together in, in the places like the temple, but also in each other's homes. And we find that they met in the temple, as the apostles did, one to worship God, but because they knew in going to the temple, they could be a witness to Jesus, to the unsaved Jews at that time. But also they met in homes, and they did so continually because they enjoyed having time with one another, because they enjoyed the company and friendship of other believers. The early church then spent much time with one another, both in witnessing, but also in fellowshipping. Here it speaks of the local church's consistency in their commitment to God, but also to each other. And they regularly gathered and spoke of Christ to the lost in one another. Now, we, we, we must ask them looking at this and their consistency, what kept them going? Why were they continually doing this stuff? And, he, and in verse 46, we, we, we present the, the motivation behind this practice, or we, we could find the, the motivation behind this practice. Uh, they, they did not meet because they felt obligated to. They did not meet simply because their parents were dragging them to church, or they were nagged simply to come, no. But in the in translations like the CSV, it puts it like this, they ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. We find here then that the attitude that allowed the church to meet together continually was joy. They gathered, why? They enjoyed being with one another. Their joy was rooted in Jesus saving them and making them into this new community. And in response to God's work, they continually were grateful to be in each other's presence. They understood that their new friendship was due to God graciously joining them. And when they entered, or when they gathered together, they experienced the joy of God's presence and enjoyed the company of like-minded, Christ-centered people. We find that the early church, they did not take Christian community for granted. Instead, they enjoyed it because they knew that this community was given and created by God's grace. Out of gratitude then, they savored, enjoyed, and continually basked in each other's presence. Previously, they were not a people, but were separated by social class, differing interests, and other trivial things. But now, because of Jesus and what He has done and how He has filled them, they have a reason to be together. And they are happy to be a part of each other's lives. And notice, this isn't true simply for a Christian community. But we find even in other communities that people often form these groups based on shared interests and hobbies. We join clubs and we play sports with each other because we want to be with people who find joy in similar things. We go to boxing gyms or workout gyms together because we want a community that learns to be fit with one another and we need people to help us improve. We join tennis clubs and gaming communities because we want to be with people who share an interest in the same thing. You see, a common interest and purpose, it's what lies at the heart of a joy-filled community. The Christian community, then, is one that people enjoy because they share a common love for Jesus and a common interest in wanting to know Him and live to glorify Him in their lives. The Christian community has a shared relationship with the Holy Spirit which transforms their desires 
making it so that all who belong share this common desire to now live for Christ. You see, the gathering of the saints should never be seen and should never be a joyless and obligatory experience. We spend time with each other as a church community consistently because each other's presence and friendship as brothers and sisters in Christ, it should make us happy. Each other's company should bring us joy because we share the same love and desire for Christ. For the Christian community to be enjoyable then for you, you must first join us in our love for Jesus. For Christian community to be enjoyable to you, especially if you've grown jaded with it and you sometimes you ask, well, I don't really care about this thing. Why am I here? For this community to be enjoyable to you, you must share the same purpose as us, which is to live for Christ and to glorify Him in all that we do. In application then, what motivates you to attend church, stay, and have fellowship even after service? What motivates you to attend small groups, dinners, and social activities with one another? Unless individual members have come to know and love Jesus, there will be no common interest that will bind them together. You see, the greater we come to love and enjoy Jesus individually, the more we will love and enjoy spending time with each other. The depth of our friendship and relationships then in this church is dependent on our individual walks with Christ. For our relationships in this church to become deep and meaningful and lasting and joyful, our relationships with Jesus matter. And they must grow and become deep and increasingly more and more joy-filled. So that unless you come to enjoy Jesus, the reality is you will not enjoy being with the people who live for Him. An attitude of joy in relation to each other is always rooted in a personal relationship with Christ. So then in going back to the initial questions, see if I can find it. What are the essential attitudes those in the church must have? The answer here is that those in the church are called to have an attitude of generosity, selflessness, and joy in Christ that is shown towards one another. Lastly, in looking at this text, we see the outcomes of happen, that happens when a church prioritizes the right things and when a church community at large, it fosters the correct attitude. In verse 43 and 47, it presents here the results of a church that prioritizes the right thing. Verse 43, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. You see, verse 43 and 47 present the results for Christians inside the community of the church, but also the impact their actions and attitudes had for the unsaved outside their church. In verse 47, the people were in awe because they were seeing God working miraculous signs through the apostles, for they were witnessing a new stage of redemptive history come into play, and the apostles were given the ability to perform miracles and works as Jesus had in order to validate that God's Spirit was indeed at work and affirming their message that Jesus really is the Christ, the Son of God. The people who saw God working through the early church responded then with reverence and a sense of respect towards God and His people. And additionally, we find in verse 47 that the people of God the Christians were led to praise God in response to their community's devotion to teaching, fellowship, and an overwhelming attitude of generosity and joy towards each other. In seeing how God transformed the many individuals in their church to devote themselves entirely to God and each other, 
and seeing how God's Spirit had transformed their attitudes to be generous and to be joy-filled individuals, the church at large was filled with praise and gratitude towards God. The church understood that it was only because of God that people could be transformed and united like this. This faithful, ongoing commitment of church or church members' dedication indicated that they had all been filled and empowered by His Spirit. And this led them to give thanks and to be increasingly in more and more awe of God's great work of transformation that He was doing in the people's lives. But notice not only the insiders were led to praise God more, those outside who witnessed the character of the church's people were convinced that truly God was at work in this community. In hearing of Jesus and in understanding the source of their transformation, many were compelled to turn and repent and place their faith in Christ as both their Savior and Lord. So that a community filled with God's Spirit and that prioritizes the right things leads its members to praise God more and causes those outside to notice how God powerfully works. The growth then of a church in our praise and adoration of God is then dependent on individual members' commitment to God and His people. Seeing how God grows us as individuals in our commitments and attitudes leads us to praise God more and more for how He miraculously works in our lives. In seeing how God can transform and change us, the outside world will not only listen to what we say, but notice our example of how we live and will be won over by Christ. So the result of a church's faithfulness to the right things is that a church will grow those who belong to it already and will grow by winning those who were once skeptical of it. If we then seek that our church would be led to praise God more, our attitudes and commitments matter. If we seek to win more for Christ, our commitment and love for each other must become so compelling that they who are outside cannot help but notice. An application then, are you an individual others would praise God for? Or are you an individual who people constantly are waiting for God to change? Are we a community that causes non-Christians to be amazed at how loving, caring, and faithful we are? Or are they put off by us because we are cold, inconsiderate, and unloving? The ability of a church to grow its members is dependent on yes, correct teaching, a community that genuinely fellowships, and an attitude of loving, care, and generosity towards each other. The ability of a church to draw in those outside to Christ is dependent on our ability to rightly display Christ's love and care, not simply by what we say, but how we act. So then do you desire that this church would grow? Commit yourselves to grow in Christ through His Word, partnering with one another for the gospel and loving and caring for each other. Committing ourselves to these things will lead others to follow our example and give them more reason to praise God. But additionally, another question is, do you desire that the lost would come to Christ? Do you desire that this church would be a shining light of the gospel to a dead and dying world? then we as a community must present a compelling witness to them of the love of God by how we act not only towards them, but also towards each other. And again, this is something that we do. We are a church that cares and shares God's word and grace with one another. And this here is a reminder to us that what we've been doing, how we have been towards one another, we ought to never forget and never stop doing. You see, church growth depends on our attitude and our faithfulness 
So then, let us then resolve to grow our church by being people who are committed to what God calls us to do and who fosters the right attitudes. If we do this, much like the church in, in Acts, we will grow. If we do this, much like the early church, our church will be powerfully used by God to bring the lost to a saving relationship with Christ. So then, in closing, this is what is exemplified by the early church. This is the priorities of the early church, the correct attitudes of the early church. And in seeing what they prioritize, and in presenting it as an example for the churches that will come after it, we are called to always conform more and more to what God calls us to be. And it starts with us individually. So then, we need to be people of the book. Spend time in hearing God's word rather than being apathetic towards it. You will not grow unless you are hearing what God says to you. Spend time with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember, we are not called to be lone soldiers in this thing. If you ever seen in, the, in those army movies that generally the lone soldier who is separated from the crew, they, they die, they suffer. For Christians to stand strong and to continue to be faithful, we need to be joined to the army of God, to the family of God, where we can support each other. So that when you're down, I'll pick you up. When I'm down, you pick me up. When I'm in need, you help care for me. When you're in need, I help care for you. And there's this mutual thing that comes in genuine Christian relationships that is beautiful. And there are many of those that we win, not simply by what we say, but because they see and they hear and they know how loving, how caring, how God has worked to change the people in this church. So we've done and been faithful to these things in the past. And again, I present this to you not to present to you anything new. No, we've grown accustomed to this. We are a caring church. We are a loving church. We have sacrificed for others' needs. But we ought to continue this if we desire there to be any future in our church. Let me just pray for us. Father, we... We pray, Father, that your word will work effectively in our hearts. And the Lord, in the same way in which you worked in our church in the past, would you continue to work in our church now and in the future, so that Grace Bible Church International would be a shining light of the gospel to the lost in the world, but also be a great blessing and benefit to those who are a part of our community. Convict us in the areas in which we need to be convicted. Would be humbly turn from the things in which we ought to turn to and be committed to the things in which we ought to be committed to. Lord, only you can change the heart. You grow your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.